Hi, this is Sarah from Connecticut, and I'm a knitter making hats for Flint, and you're listening to Two Broads Talking Politics. Hey everyone, this is Kelly with Two Broads Talking Politics, and I am here in this segment with Galen Miller, who is the executive director of an organization called Pack Your Back. And so we're going to talk about Pack Your Back and and what it does, and then in the second half of the episode, Sophie is actually going to interview me about a fundraiser that I've started for Pack Your Back uh, called Knitters for Flint. So hello, Galen. Hello, how are you? I'm great. Thanks so much for joining me. No problem. Can you give just a, sort of a really brief synopsis of what Pack Your Back is, and then we'll go into a little more detail after that. Yeah, so Pack Your Back is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that I started my freshman year of college after holding a water distribution in Flint, Michigan. After holding that water distribution, I just saw the need that was happening in the city, and I got some people together in my residence hall back at school, and we basically just came to the conclusion that we we would create an organization to help the children in Flint that were affected by the water crisis. And with that, we started collecting school supplies within our first year, and then everything's just kind of escalated since then. Our first year, we were able to help a little over 100 students. Our second year, a little over 1,500 students. And now this year, we're at over 25,000 students in our third year. So it's been a really big undertaking, but it's totally worth it when you see all the kids' faces when they're at our events. So I think some people, uh, you know, uh, everyone has probably heard about Flint and and heard about the water crisis there, but maybe some people don't have a sort of a very good understanding of it and and what the situation still is there. Can you talk just a little bit about kind of what's been going on there? Yeah, so everyone knows about the water crisis and when the city's water was transferred over to a different um, source. And it caused the pipes to corrode and everything with the lab poisoning. But since all that, a lot of politics have happened inside of the city, between the city and state and federal government, just are not coming to conclusions with anything of helping out the residents in Flint. So this spring, actually, the state used to be doing um, state-funded water distribution sites, but then they stopped doing that back in April and they basically said that the water is clean. You should be drinking out of your taps by this point. But the mayor and the city officials say that it's not clean to drink. So once that happened, we started holding water distributions, basically to just keep getting residents the clean water that they need because we know the water is not safe still. And then at those distributions, just the amount of people that show up and everything just proves that people don't trust what's going on. They don't trust what they're being told. And also they don't believe that the water is clean. So it's still in a really bad state. There's a lot of effects that are happening in the city due to the water crisis that aren't necessarily water related. People are still being required to pay for their water, even though they aren't drinking it. They're still getting their water bills and stuff, and it's causing them to basically lose their homes and everything. So there's a lot of different things that go into it. So that's where our organization kind of comes into play to help get those resources like school supplies and just the everyday essentials to people. But as for what's happening right now in the city, we just got a new governor, um, Governor Gretchen Whitmer, and she is talking right now about reopening up the water stations that the state is funding. So there's a little bit of progress, but it's going to have a lot of long-term, long-term effects. Yeah, and so I hadn't realized how – Big Flint is. It's not a a big city, but uh, in the 2010 census, it had over 100,000 people. So it's actually a, a, you know, sort of medium sized city, bigger than I had realized. Of course, it's estimated to have fewer people uh, by the next census. Um, But it but it's still a reasonable number of people to be trying to help through this crisis. Yeah, for sure. It's it's surprisingly like there's a lot of people, but it's kind of easy to navigate and stuff. It's an interesting set for sure. Okay, so let's go back a little bit to sort of the, the start of Pack Your Back and, and how you got working with that. So you said the, the initial thing you were doing was a, a water distribution event. Was that through your college? 
Yeah, so my freshman year, I joined a fraternity called the Theta, and with that fraternity, it was right when everything was starting to get going in Flint. So we kind of just collaborated as a group, and we determined that we would do a water distribution. We were actually able to supply over 38,000 bottles of water to the residents there, and that was just a bunch of students going down and helping pass out water to people. So that's kind of how it all got started. And then the initial group of students that started it were all CNU students. And since then, it's kind of drifted a little bit away from that since people have started graduating and whatnot. But we still do have some alumni involved that sit on our board of directors and stuff. And so how many people are involved with Pack Your Back now? Yeah, so right now we have about eight people who are actively helping us plan events and just fundraise all the time. And then we have a board of directors that has about eight people on it. And what are the kinds of events that you do? Yeah, so we hold school supply distributions. We do family fun days in the summer. We are starting a new program where we're going to be doing movie showings over the summer, where we'll be showing a new movie that's got out of the movie theaters but isn't quite on DVD yet. We'll be doing that outside with a few bounce houses and stuff, and we're going to try to incorporate um, educational factor in that. So if the movie has a that goes along with it, we're going to pass out those books to all the students that are there. Another program that we're working on is a teacher distribution aspect where we're kind of we're going to go on the road and essentially go around the whole state of Michigan and set up these pop up shops where teachers can come and get school supplies and other support for their classroom. We're going to try to do that all around the state of Michigan. And then we're going to be working on our annual school supply distributions, a Halloween party, and then also annual Stuff Your Stocking event where kids can come get toys, backpacks, hats, coats, school supplies, you name it. So what has been the response of the community to uh, the kind of events that you've been doing? Yeah, so all of our um, events have gotten positive feedback from the community. It's really interesting, our organization, on how our fundraising happens and everything. I would say probably 85% of our donations are grassroots. So that's just people from all around the United States just donating out of their own pockets towards our organization, and they're not necessarily even in Michigan. And about 15% of that comes from corporations and foundations with grants. So the response is really interesting just to see all these people in the country just kind of coming together to help support this cause because everyone knows that it's a community that is still in desperate need. But um, at the community aspect, everyone who comes to our events is just super thankful of getting the support that they are getting. And just seeing the children's faces when they're receiving like their toys or backpacks, it just makes all the months of hard work and everything worth it. And you guys have done some partnering with uh, Little Miss Flint as well. I think a lot of people are are aware of her and the the activism that she's doing. Can you talk a little bit about that? So our organization got involved with Mari Kopney, also known as Little Miss Flint, right at the very beginning. Before we filed any of the paperwork with the government, I'm a nonprofit organization, I actually wanted to speak with someone living in the city to kind of just see what it's like firsthand, like what the effects are with the water crisis and what it's really like living there. So I reached out to Mari's mother, Lulu, and we kind of just had a conversation. And I asked them a few questions like, what's it like living there? How has this affected your everyday life and all that? And then we went in depth with questions, resources, do you think? the city needs and stuff and how would you go about this and ever since that conversation we just have partnered for every single event that we put on at a fundraising standpoint and Mari essentially will go on Twitter and just share our campaign all over the place and that's where the majority of our donations will come in from all country with her just sharing that on Twitter so it's been a really great partnership and it's really allowed us to grow quite a bit so it's just really amazing He's such a young person wanting to do so much good in the community. So I think that's really a compelling story when you add that aspect to it. Yeah, definitely. So what, you know, is sort of the the ultimate goal? Let's say we get to a point where Flint does have <laughs> uh, drinkable water and, and, you know, things aren't maybe quite as dire in Flint. Uh, you mentioned the organization is already giving out school supplies, you know, sort of throughout the state. But do you have plans to grow this organization beyond Flint uh, eventually? You know, what's sort of the, the long-term plan? Yeah, so one thing that 
our organization really is working on right now is our change maker program that we're really trying to establish and get the word out about what essentially the vision of that is, is getting young people who want to do good in the community, the platform to do good in the community. So similar to what we're doing right now with Mari, with her doing the fundraising for our organization and all that stuff, and kind of just helping us on the back end as well, put on the events, we kind of want to get some more people on board, some young people who want to do good so they can do it, but then they kind of have the experts on the back end that know essentially how to get it done and how to put on these events. So that's another big program that we're looking to launch right now. We've also done a few things in the Detroit area. Um, I think we all know about the Detroit school system with the bankruptcies and everything that have happened there. And we've done a lot down there in getting backpacks and school supplies as well. So sometimes if we have an access and point where we can't get rid of it and we're sitting on school supplies and stuff, we'll take that down to Detroit to get it out to the students there. And other than that, we kind of just help teachers out whenever they ask. So, And are you now still a student? Yes. So I am actually still a student at Central Michigan University. I'm going into my senior year. I'm in my senior year right now, I should say. But um, I have to complete a 30-week internship before I can graduate. So that's the next step. I have a whole other year. <laughs> and what has working on this organization, building a nonprofit while you're in college, how has that complemented your studies? This has been by far the most challenging thing I've ever done in my life, but it's also been the most rewarding thing I've ever done. It's interesting because before I came to college, I there was no way that anyone would have ever guessed that this is what I'd be doing, but it kind of is just how everything's worked out. So it's been a really interesting shift, essentially going into college and then starting this right my freshman year. But it's definitely been challenging keeping up on my classwork. I'm also very involved in school here. I oversee the Greek life system as the interfraternity council here on campus. And then I also oversee the program board, which oversees a massive budget and about 50 events for students, ranging from concerts to lectures and comedians and stuff like that. So it's I'm definitely always moving all the time, so it's been really challenging to just live the college life, but also be able to run an organization as well, and also basically learn along the way of how to do everything that's going on with the organization, because I'm also not majoring in anything relating to nonprofit. <laughs> so it's definitely a big learning. So I have to ask, do you see politics in your future? Sounds like you've got a good uh, background for that now. <laughs> I mean, I've considered it. I think uh, running for something at a city standpoint or state level would be fun, but I don't know. I think state representative would be really fun, especially with everything that's happening right now. Yeah, it certainly seems like uh, Michigan could use some good people to uh, yeah. to help fix these problems. Uh, Michigan, of course, is went uh, a lot bluer in this past election in 2018. Uh, and you mentioned Gretchen Whitmer started as the uh, the new governor, and there there seem to be some people who are, are interested in solving some of these problems. Yeah, and she's been really supportive of everything that's going on, like with the assistance in the Flint community. She actually was just down there on Saturday. She's doing this uh, tour around the state right now called the Whitmer Warm Ups, basically just going to all of these these cities and seeing what the communities need so she's better able to assist them. So she was just in Flint at the farmer's market this past Saturday. So she's been very supportive of the community. Is there anything else that you would like to make sure people know? I just want to thank you all for helping us, our organization, grow and for helping us with the fundraiser that you guys are putting on. All right. Excellent. So listeners should stay tuned after the segment break. I will be back on with Sophie and we'll be talking about Knitters for Flint, which is a way that uh, I'm trying to raise some money for Pack Your Back. And we hope it'll be very successful because we think your organization could really use the funds in a really meaningful way. Well, thank you very much for everything you guys are doing. everybody. It's Sophie from Two Brothers Talking Politics, back again with my co-host and also guest, Kelly. Hey, Kelly. <laughs> hey, Sophie. And Kelly's here to tell us all the Knitters for Flint 
Um, it's a group that she and some other crafters have started, and she's going to tell us all about it, how it works, and how you can get involved. So why don't we just start off with, can you just give us a basic description of what Knitters for Flint is? Yeah, so uh, Knitters for Flint is basically some crafters, mostly knitters, <laughs> but also some crocheters, who want to use the the power of our craft, of our, our knitting and crocheting, to raise money for Flint. So tell us a little bit, uh, first of all, what do you knit? So I'm mostly knitting hats, and I think that's what most people are doing. Uh, I personally love knitting hats. Hats are kind of the perfect portable project. I have it in my bag with me all the time. And everybody in the winter who lives in cold weather places needs hats. And so I think uh, I'm mostly knitting hats, but other people are as well. But I, I really, crafters can knit anything. And so I have a couple of shawls that I've put up. You know, there are other people who may be knitting things like headbands and, and mittens and things like that, uh, but primarily hats. And so we had just spoken with Gayla from Pack Your Back, and the money raised by this project is going to Pack Your Back. But can you tell us a little bit about how the knitted things turn into money? Are you selling them? How does the donation system work? Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so I've been doing this thing for a while now, I, this sort of thing for a while now, where I, I would just knit things because I like knitting, and I, I love having something to knit all the time. And so sometimes people, I, I was giving away a lot of knitting, and sometimes people would say to me, well, can I pay you for your knitting? And I, I don't like taking money directly for knitting. I don't want to earn money for knitting because it will be less fun for me then. And so for a long time now, I, basically the whole Trump administration, I've been saying, you know, well, you know, don't give money to me, give money to, uh, and I would name an organization or a, a political campaign and say, give money to them. You know, I, I don't need the money they do, go give the money to them. And so I, I've been doing a lot more of that lately, where I would say, uh, try to raise money for a particular organization. And, you know, so I would post a hat on Twitter and say, if you want this hat, then give money to X foundation and I'll mail you the hat. So what happened with this was one of these pieces I had put up, I was raising money for a veterans organization and Joyce Vance, who many of you know, previous guest on the podcast uh, and also a frequent MSNBC contributor. She saw it on Twitter and said, how didn't I know you were doing this? She's also a big knitter and said, I'd love to contribute a hat. So she and I started DMing about it on Twitter. And, you know, I said, well, the next organization I want to raise money for is something in Flint. At that point, I didn't even know what in Flint. And uh, she said, well, that sounds great. I'd love to do that. I'm sure I know a lot of other knitters who want to do that, too. There's another knitter who has been doing designs, uh, knitting designs, to raise money for Flint. And so Joyce had gotten in touch with her and found out she was going through Pack Your Back to, to get the money to Flint. So I talked to Galen and said, what's the best way to do this? You know, should should we collect money and send it to Pack Your Back? Should we have people send money directly to Pack Your Back? What should we do? And he let me know that there's a, a way to set up a campaign through Pack Your Back. And so what we did was we set up a campaign that's a Knitters for Flint campaign, so we can keep track of how much money we've raised through this project. But the money donated on that website goes directly to Pack Your Back. And so what we've been doing is posting knitted items. Uh, so far, it's just me, but there's a lot of other knitters I know who are working on knitted items, and hopefully we'll be posting there soon. And if somebody wants the knitted item, they go to this campaign website, and they click on it, donate, and then, you know, get a, a PDF or a, a JPEG of their uh, page that shows that they made the donation. They send that to me and I send them the hat. So I don't ever see any of the money directly. I don't have to collect the money. People don't have to be worried that it's, you know, sort of landing with, with me or any other knitters and not going to the organization. It's going directly to the organization. The person who makes the donation gets the tax break. Does that still exist? Maybe that doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> I don't know. I, I know something was changed to that tax break as a result of the Trump bill, but I don't know. Maybe you do, maybe you don't get a tax break. But in any case, you have a record <laughs> that, that you made this donation and then you get a hat. And so what I've been doing is I actually have been even 
shipping them without charging any money. I think that's up to individual crafters how they want to do that, how much, you know, whether they can contribute the shipping or would like the person to pay for the shipping themselves. Um, but that's uh, essentially what we're doing. So it's not selling hats exactly. It's exchanging hats or other items for proof of a donation. So other knitters can get involved in this and they don't have to, you know, send their stuff to you or anything. They can just go and post their their knitted items on the campaign. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. So I would love it. I'd love as many knitters, crafters of any kind who want to get involved to do this. So you can do it completely on your own. We're going to have links on our website up to... uh, the, the website is knittersforflint.org, and you can go there and get a link to the donation campaign page. So you can you can do that completely on your own without ever even letting us know you're doing it, and people are just donating directly to this campaign. Or it's it's really fun to do it sort of as a community. So you can post if you post on either Twitter or on Instagram, and and tag us in the post. I'll, I'm happy to sort of repost it, let people know that you have an item up as well. Uh, so with the hashtag knitters for Flint with F-O-R spelled out. And our Twitter handle is knitters for Flint with the four as the number four because Twitter doesn't let you have enough characters. But, uh, you know, we're, we're happy to retweet, repost on Instagram. If you if you use the hashtag, I'm trying to search the hashtag and, and retweet those sorts of things. Um, but definitely if you tag us, then I'll see it and and can retweet those. Uh, but, you know, it it's kind of fun. Uh, and I've also said for anyone who's not comfortable using social media, if you don't have Twitter or Instagram, don't want to use those, that's totally fine, too. If you just want to email in the information and a picture and I'll post it for you and we can sort of work out the, the details about, you know, how much money you want someone to have donated to get the item. I'm happy to do all of that legwork or if it gets to be too much for just me, you know, if this really takes off, then I've got other people I can recruit to help with the social media part. I just want there to, to I just want to raise a lot of money for for Pack Your Back and for Kids in Flint. And however that happens is great. And so this is just one way of sort of streamlining the process. Can you tell us about how many people are doing this right now? Any sort of estimate about how many posted so far? So, so far, all of the items posted, as far as I can tell, (laughs) unless people aren't using the hashtag, which is entirely possible, all of the items posted have been posted by me. And so I've put up, uh, I think, eight or nine hats and a couple of shawls, some of which are still available. So, you know, if you are listening to this and you are not a crafter and, and want to get in on the donating money and getting a hat out of it, please go look at our Instagram and, and Twitter feeds and find some hats uh, or shawls that you would like to get. But I know a bunch of other knitters, uh, you know, and I don't know numbers, but I'd say I personally know at least, you know, 10 or 15 other knitters who are currently working on projects. Uh, There's some people talking about the project on Ravelry, which is a big knitters forum and some other places. And so I know there are other people who are working on projects. I Mm -hmm. expect, you know, I, and a lot of these hats are hats that I knit while I was on break uh, on Christmas break for two weeks and had a lot of time to just knit, you know, in the car and and sitting in my parents' house. So I got a jump start on those, but for people who are are working and child minding, you know, knitting is usually a little bit slower than that. So, uh, so I expect a lot of things to start going up in the next week or so. So at the beginning, you had said that although it's called Knitters for Flint, you're not necessarily discouraging people who are other doing other crafts. Is that the case? Can people who do other crafty things post? Because my husband doesn't knit and I don't knit, but my husband does really nice uh, wheel pottery. And so he usually gives that for charitable causes. So he, he would probably be willing to do that. Is that something that people are allowed to do as well? Sure. I mean, essentially, there's no rules, right? <laughs> I just want to raise money mm-hmm. for Flint. And so, you know, if if people would like to make any kind of items and, you know, you can use the knitters for Flint hashtag or not, as long as you figure out a way to, to get proof of donation. And, uh, you know, ideally, if you can do it through our campaign so we can sort of track what the, the progress was on it. 
But yes, yeah, certainly there are going to be people crocheting. I've talked to people who are crocheting. I am terrible at crocheting myself. And uh, <laughs> Joyce and I, uh, when we were talking about this originally, uh, we're both knitters. And so that's just sort of the, the name we came up with. But but yeah, definitely crochet if people want to sew, if people want to draw pictures, you know, pottery, woodworking, whatever it is. You know, I, I think that's terrific, you know, and I I have no sense of how big this might be. When you post the campaign, you have to post your goal. And I put $50,000 because I was being super ambitious. I don't actually expect we'll get anywhere near $50,000, but, but hey, maybe we will. And, you know, mm-hmm. I, I think it's the kind of thing, uh, as you just heard from Galen, there's a huge need. And so the more money we can raise, the better. And, I, you know, I'm certainly not going to limit the, the crafts that people can do. I will say that I would not be happy if any of these crafts were, you know, sort of pro-wall, pro-Trump sort of (laughs) items that people were making or racist messaging or anything like that. But I can't control who uses hashtags. And so really anyone is free to use the hashtags. So if people want a custom made piece, can they request that or or are people limited to the things that other people post? Yeah, yeah. So I have made a number of custom items now that people have requested. Uh, You know, usually it's because they want very specific colors on a hat, you know, colors of their school or their favorite colors. And I'm happy to do that. Of course, I'm one person, so (laughs) I can't guarantee if this really takes off. And a lot of people want custom items that I could fulfill all those requests. But I, you know, I think there are a lot of knitters, other crafters out there who may be very interested in doing that. So for right now, I'm saying, if people want to request a custom item, that emailing us at knittersforflint at gmail.com is the easiest way to do that. For as many items as I can take on the request myself, I'm happy to do that. And if not, I know a, a large army of knitters and I'm happy to pass on requests. Is there anything else you want to talk to me about? So the other thing is that as some people would like to send items directly to Flint instead of raising money, and that's mm-hmm. totally fine too. From my perspective, I feel like most of the items I am capable of knitting, uh, just the cost of the yarn alone and the cost of my time, I can raise more money with them than they would be worth as an item to Flint, and so I've chosen to do it this way. But if you really want your your hats, mittens, you know, anything like that, scarves to, to go directly to Flint, Pack Your Back is able to disperse those items to kids in Flint, and that's totally fine, too. So on our website, knittersforflint.org, is an address that you can send things directly to. This is not directly to Pack Your Back. A friend of mine who lives in Michigan has set up a P.O. box to collect things, and then she will drive them to Flint uh, to hand them off. Doing it that way, in case we would get a big influx of items, we don't want to put the administrative burden on Pack Your Back to sort of get one thing at a time and figure out what to do with it. So we'll send it all as a as a group. And we're asking for those items, if you want to send them in, uh, you know, and again, you can find the, the P.O. box where you can send them. We'd like those to be received in Michigan by February 25th. Well, that's awesome. We are, as you mentioned, going to post links to all of this. So listeners, if you knit or you do other crafts and you're interested in getting involved, follow the link to Knitters for Flint. If you are interested in buying some knitted products or some other cool crafted items, do the same thing. Go check out what's up there. And together we can maybe raise some money for the kids in Flint. Yeah, I, I'm really excited by this. There's nothing I love doing more than knitting and knowing that the knitting is being used for a good cause uh, just makes my heart really happy. Thanks for listening to Two Broads Talking Politics. Our theme song is called Are You Listening? off of the album Elephant Shaped Trees by the band Immunuri, and we're using it with permission of the band. Our logo and other original artwork is by Matthew Wethlin and was created for use by this podcast.